<laughs> but it's nice to see you all here. Here's a here's a shady grove. <laughs> Hi everyone and welcome to Occidental Center for the Arts first virtual book launch. We're so thrilled that you're here this afternoon to support OCA and our dear friends Donna and Jared. Okay. Um, for over 10 years OCA has been a cornerstone of our community offering world-class music, dance, theater, written word, and visual arts. With the arrival of COVID, and the sudden shutdown of our facility mid-March, our executive director, Tina Marchetti, skillfully produced three very successful virtual fundraising events over the summer with music, theater, poetry from over 30 artists and a stunning virtual tour of our art gallery. Through the generosity of our widespread community, we gratefully, gratefully, and I say that many times, uh, raised funds to keep us afloat during these challenging times. We're so glad that so many of you are here today. The advantage of Zoom is that, of course, we're no longer limited geographically. Some of you this afternoon are from out of town or state and would not normally be able to attend in person. I know we have some of Donna's fans from all over the place. A shout out to New York, North Carolina, Georgia, Colorado, Arizona, Southern California, which is sort of a different state. <laughs> anyway, welcome in. And even if you're local, you don't have to get dressed up and drive a distance in your car. You can be in the comfort of your own home in your PJs if you wanted to. And don't worry, we won't look. And I don't need to stand up on stage and tell you where the bathrooms are or to silence your cell phones. The disappointing part is that we can't share our refreshments with you and our space and gather to chat informally before and after the event. But nonetheless, we welcome you here to settle in, sip and snack in the comfort of your own home. Donna Emerson and her son, Jared, close friends and longtime supporters of OCA and our literary and musical community, were set to launch last March and have been very patiently waiting. Recently retired from teaching at Santa Rosa Junior College and private practice as a clinical social worker, Donna is a writer of poetry, creative nonfiction, essays, and memoir. Her award-winning poetry includes four chapbooks and two full-length poetry collections, The Place of Our Meeting and This Afternoon, Beside the Well. Her recent awards include nominations for the California Book Award, two pushcarts, and the Best of the Net nominations and two Allen Ginsberg Awards. And her son, Jared Emerson Johnson, is an award-winning composer, sound designer, and voice director. Since the early 2000s, Jared has also worked as a musical instructor at Cinnabar Theater's educational department, coaching chamber music and conducting various operettas and musicals. Since 2017, he's performed as frontman with the Rivertown Skipplers, 
a lively jug band well known to Sonoma and Marin County residents and listeners. He also plays violin in the North Bay Sinfonietta. Donna's latest poetry collection, Beside the Well, takes us from the wells, woods, meadows, horses, family, and neighbors of her family homestead in the New York Finger Lakes to the music, ocean, and earth in her current California. In plain spoken diction, narrative, and lyric styles, Donna records memorable time-stopping moments of intimacy. As another longtime OCA friend and local writer, writing coach, Susan Bono remarks, and I quote, Donna's ability to focus on and carefully describe a maple tree, a snowfall, a buck in white birch, gives them almost mythical properties. She starts and ends with a family farm. These poems seem to spring from the soil where the poet spent her childhood, gra her childhood, ground so deeply known we can almost feel the sun, wind, and rain that shaped her sensibilities. She tells hard truths without bitterness. No matter how intellectual and wise she can be, she is so of this earth. I mean this as a compliment, the biggest compliment I know. This afternoon, Donna will read selected poems with musical interludes from her son, with her son, Jared. During this time, you're gonna be muted. At the end, we'll all unmute. Oh, uh, at the end, I think we'll stay unmuted and we'll um, do a symbolic applause. And I'll tell you how to do that when we get there. <laughs> Following this, we'll have a 15 minute Q&A and for a lively discussion where um, we'll all be muted and I'll tell you then how you can uh, raise your hand so that uh, Tina can unmute you and you can ask your question and you'll be highlighted. Um, and then also, um, there'll be a way to purchase books and that's really important. Do buy the book. It's $23, including tax and postage. And Donna is kindly donating 20% of book sales to OCA. You can pay by credit card, PayPal, or check. And we'll give you further instructions when we get to that point. Um, and although this event and all our book launches are free, we gratefully welcome any donation to OCA you, that you might be able to offer at this time. You can either add a donation to your book sale payment or do it as a separate payment. So that being said, I'm, we're ready, I think, to hear Donna and Jared. Let's begin. Thank you, Suze. And thank you, Tina, for all the work you've done behind the scenes. We can't be in your beautiful theater today, but I'm delighted that you brought the spirit of OCA with you. And I think everyone can feel it by the way you talk. <laughs> we just saw some signs as you were speaking that there's some, some more people here from New York. And um, Betty is originally from Africa, but now New York. So hello. <laughs> um, I want to say hello to all my friends and family from all over the country. This is the first time some of them have, have been able to hear me read. And um, that, that's what made me want to do this, that we could share this with so many people. Well, I've often written about my homestead in New York because it just comes to me all the time. Uh, this book, Beside the Well, is particularly dedicated to the farm. Um, it was there that with my grandparents, 11 cousins, aunts and uncles and parents uh, got formed. I, I think what happened there has a lot to do with who I became. Um, and even the poems that are not about the farm reflect the values that were born on the farm. I have a little house there still and my brother Ralph and I visit as often as we can. Jared spent summer vacations there growing up also and goes with his family now. Uh, for those who haven't seen the book, I don't know how to show this on the, can you see this? How do I show this book? <laughs> here it is. Well, let's see if I put it right here. Hmm. You can almost see <laughs> the cover, which is a painting of the farmhouse, um, painted by my aunt, Helen Dascom who died at the age of 99 a few years ago. 
I photographed the painting and I dedicated the book to all four of my grandparents uh, with a quote, they still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. The first poem is about the first well that my grandfather introduced me to. We had seven wells on the farm, 20, 225 acres, and the title comes from how often everything happened near the wells. <laughs> so the first poem is called Beside the Well. After we fenced Jenny's pasture, Grandpa called me under the northern spy apple tree. You're 10 years old. It's time you learn about wells. He rolled a big stone off a broad plank of wood. As he lifted that cover, I looked down into a brown barrel with no bottom. Water filled half of it. A long rope and pail sat next to it, attached to a tree root. This is Jenny's water. You'll feed her here. Use this bucket to pull up her drink. He, let, laid, he held his arm across my body. Don't lean over too far or you'll fall in. I felt important, let in on a secret, a mystery in the middle of the ground. Having known only water from faucets, I watched grandpa hurl the pail down the cavernous opening. As he pulled it back up, he warned, be sure the water isn't roily. He took a big gulp. You have to take out any debris or dead animals that sometimes get in over the winter. I nodded, yikes. That sounded like more than I could manage. I swallowed solemnly, sat back on my haunches as grandpa held the dipper to my lips. Clean, clear water, colder than I expected. How can no taste taste this good? We sat still beside the well a while, full, silent. We had a lot of rain on the farm in the summers and still do. And it's different from California rain. <laughs> the other night when we had that lightning and thunder which led to all the 625 fires, I thought, gosh, on the farm, this rain and lightning and thunder would clear everything up. Uh, and so you can understand that I'm very attached to rain. The, the poem I'm gonna read next is called First Rain. And it's about, I think I wrote it the day, the day when we had rain for the first time after four years of drought in California. As I hurtle north, Sudden rain pelts my car windows, a cascade of pearls. I leave the wipers off, my breath deepens, my speed slows. When I can't see the road anymore, I pull to the side next to the field above Novato in Godmother's pumpkin patch. I take off layers of clothes to feel the sun, the rain, slip out of the car, Watch it land on dry shoulders, craped arms. Cool rills bathe me, new smells of fresher air, sage, dripping water I can feel after four years of drought. Wet soaking deep into thirsty skin, water puddling above my collarbone. Sheets of water gathering until rivulets form, running down thighs to my feet. The surprise of this rain makes its own music on hard surfaces around me. Rocks, posts, snare drums played with brushes. On the bending grasses, the upper strings of a harp. Ravel crosses his left hand over his right before the glissando in judo. Glittering rain. Dust rising from the cracked ground the dirt smelling almost like earth again, lighter than before, silvery, salvaged, surfeited. I sit down against a fence post, shaking water from my hair, touching drops in my ears, eyes, 
dry mouth open to rainwater's christening. I wrote that poem in a uh, weekend workshop with Ellen Bass. And I guess I, I presented the poem, the, maybe the first half. And she said, you got to keep going. <laughs> Don't stop. So I kept going. And that's also the poem that Sakari Vanderveer chose to um, read on stage with her quartet when she um, composed music for her viola and her group down in, in uh, Pasadena and Santa Monica. Some of you know about that. OK. The third poem is about horses. We had horses on the farm. Uh, Grandpa traded the horses. Well, he, had, he had a friend who had two horses, and she would let him have them for the summer so we could learn to ride, and he would pasture them. And so this one is about both of those horses. It's called Riding Bareback. And by the way, I do change the names of people in, my, in a lot of my poems, so nobody feels singled out. <laughs> Molly always challenged me, expected no. She was on the stallion, leading the mare, wanted to gallop on alone. She dared me to ride Jenny without a saddle, pushing out thoughts like, I have no shoes on. I've never done this before. Sure. Molly laced her fingers, palms up, to help pitch me up. I jumped like a jackrabbit, almost slid clean off the horse's back. Squeezed my knees, feeling brown, muscled warmth from the Morgan's ride in the sun. The mare at once flew after her mate. My legs around her belly slippery. My teeth rattled. I only saw a blur of wheat and tree as she cantered, then galloped. This is what no control means, flying high, bounce to crashing, my hair straight back, my head swinging, mom running out to the road. My small body veered down toward horse legs, dusty dirt of the road below. I grabbed the ends of the mare's long black mane, pulled up, leaning tight into her neck, more like dragged along hoped for a few more yards of life, sputtered out, whoa. She stopped short and I fell off, air knocked out of me, onto the front lawn between the house and the well. Uh, the next poem many of you will recognize because it's a poem about my first husband. The poem is called Cole Took Me Flying in His Cessna. Cole took me flying in his Cessna, threw a roll of toilet paper out the cabin window, and dove the plane through the loops it made. We almost hit the trees. He took me quail and dove hunting on horseback at the family farm in Alabama. Dogs pointing, doves falling to soft sandy soil, quail bunches in the dog's mouth. I couldn't eat that night. Cole flew me to his other house on the Gulf Coast, land of sugar and turquoise water. We, we waited there with sand sharks, wore no clothes, loved the thrill of water whirling through us. His looped mother shouted to me through the heirloom, excuse me, the bedroom door. It was an heirloom. I pretended I couldn't hear. The night cousin Wendy won the Miss USA pageant, Cole walked her all over the fountain, fountain blow on his arm. I began to pull away, the beginnings of doubt. I didn't know why. Separations, shaken. I fell asleep for a long time, filed for divorce. Cole pulled the telephone off the wall when I told him, just after offering me a horse I could keep in Golden Gate Park. The next poem is about uh, my work in San Francisco as a social worker. I worked at the Lighthouse for the Blind. And some of you may know that the Lighthouses, both in New York and San Francisco, had workshops where the blind, uh, usually men, but some women, worked making brooms. And this was about one of the fellows who worked in the broom shop. 
The poem is called Jacob Opens the Door. I was there to check for neglect. Perhaps Jacob knew he wouldn't open the door. He hadn't been to the lighthouse for a week where his unfinished broom stood in his work corner. Forced to conduct our interview through the iron grates at the top of his steps, I glanced about to see if our loud shouts to each other disturbed the neighbors. Just up from Market Street, I was safe. Everyone was yelling. Mid-January, cold, pungent rain blew up my dress from the dirty street. When I told him I was cold, he opened the door. He didn't offer a chair. We stood near his pulled out Murphy bed in his dark living room, a foot apart. When I moved back, Jacob moved forward, cocked his head. I decided he needed to hear me at close range, spoke into his closer ear. Jacob was naked, blind, almost 80. Telling him I was concerned, I checked his refrigerator and cupboards. No alcohol, no supplies. He had no food in his apartment. Jacob listened to me rustle. The neighbors feed me when the welfare check comes. Have a daughter in Daly City. Brings vegetables from her garden. Cindy comes every week. She's my eyes. I called her to check. She asked how he was doing, assured me she was coming tomorrow. The neighbors hold it together pretty well, she said. Smiling as I spoke to his Cindy, my pink round client should relax, stood relaxed with hands on hips, looking better nourished as if he dressed this way every day. Mighty nice of you to drop by. Come on up anytime. That was my first nude interview. Um, the next poem is about my daughter. Um, this is a poem that I wrote the first half when she was five years old, when she had just completed a painting in kindergarten. And the second half I wrote when six, well, she was 16, I think, 11 years later. And this is the poem that won one of the Allen Ginsberg uh, Awards in 2017. Let's see. Yeah, okay. The poem is called Shining Brown Hair. I cry openly today as the pastor leaves our church. I'm crying for myself as my daughter prepares and does not prepare to leave home. Well into autumn, she refuses to write her college applications. Homework interferes, she says, as her father and I pace, clench our jaws, regard calendar deadlines, and worry. Of course, we suffered this with her older brothers, not knowing they were leaving for good. We didn't know then about the transformation. I don't want her to change. I want the girl who still reads her essays aloud, whose hair tumbles as we joke about boys and French. A man told me today his daughter never came home again after she left for college. Now he uses a cane, shuffles, forgets a lot. He says again, she had shining brown hair. Uh, something completely different. This is an old, this is an American tune, Rock Island Line. <laughs> It goes like this. It's a train song. Ooh. Now I gotta start a little slower. Here we go. Well, the Rock Island Line, well, she's a mighty good road. The Rock Island Line, oh, she's a road to ride. The Rock Island Line, yes, she's a mighty good road. If you want to ride, you've got to ride it like you find it. Get your ticket at the station for the Rock Island Line. Well, I may be right, may be wrong, but you're gonna miss me when I'm gone. I said the Rock Island Line, a mighty good road. That's the Rock Island Line, well, she's a road to ride. The Rock Island Line, well, she's a mighty good road. And if you 
want to ride, you got to ride it like you find it. Get your ticket at the station for the Rock Island Line. I said the Rock Island Line, she's the mighty good and wrong. That's the Rock Island Line, she's the road to ride. The Rock Island Line, well, she's the mighty good and wrong. And if you want to ride, you got to ride it like you find it. Get your ticket at the station for the Rock Island Line. Well, A, B, C. Double X, Y, Z. Come on, pretty baby, take a ride with me. I said the Rock Island Line, she's a mighty good road. Rock Island Line, well, she's a road to ride. And the Rock Island Line, she's a mighty good road. If you want to ride, you got to ride it like you find it. Get your ticket at the station for the Rock Island Line. I said the Rock Island Line, mighty good road. Yes, the Rock Island Line, well, she's a road to ride. Rock Island Line, she's a mighty good road. If you want to ride, you got to ride it like you find it. Get your ticket at the station for the Rock Island Line. I said, the rock out of line, mighty good road. It's the rock out of line, she's the road to ride. Rock out of line, she's a mighty good run. If you want to ride, you gotta ride it like you find it. Get your ticket at the station for the rock out of line. Whoa. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right. Wow. <laughs> If you want to write it, you got to write it like you find it. I like that. I think it's how I've lived my life. <laughs> the next three poems, uh, well, the next two poems are about tapping the maple trees on the farm just 18 months ago. Mom always talked about making maple syrup with grandpa, with horses and a sugar house in the lower woods. We talked with a Mennonite friend near the farm who said, he could show us the steps to tapping the trees and boiling the syrup down. So last March, a year ago, we went there and our kids, Juliet and Chris, were able to join us for a few days in the woods. The first poem is called Vernal Sap. Juliet says I should sit back. <laughs> um, we run with our pails to the sugar maples marked last summer when leaves were easy to read, their crowns high and wide. Daughter taps the spile in place amid several versions of ah, as clear sap drips out. We discover an unexpected bush of sugar maples across the road from the original trees. Their seedlings blew straight across so that nine young trees stand equidistant most too young yet to tap. In a day, 15 trees are tapped, named, embraced for their beauty and life force given freely to us, as long as we protect them from harm. As did my mother, uncles, grandparents, and great-grandparents over the last 200 years. This marks the start of spring, when we see water flow for the first time under the ice on the road. Daughter finishes her work, hugs the tree, and names it eldest granddaughter. The gushing older tree by the old farmhouse, we name grandmother, her bark thick, scarred, lumpy in spots like a darned sock. Holds a frozen bit of sap where a vertical waist-high crevice sits it must have access to her heartwood. And then the next poem that went with it is called Mystery of the Boil. We boil maple sugar sap in our old fire pit in the open. For hours, sweet, sweet steam wafts around our bodies, smoke around our feet. Half a day passes while we feed the fire and stir what feels like only water. One of us stirring, one or two gathering wood from the woods. Locust is the most dense, lasts the longest. The 10 gallon pot sustains a rolling boil, reducing liquid to a gallon. Then comes the caramel colored sap we filter through cheesecloth into small pots. Stories emerge of how grandpa did these same things in these woods with the horses. 
or the year they made a sugar shack freezing outdoors in late January. Then we moved to the kitchen, the kitchen stove for measuring the final boil, anticipation rising with the temperature. We wait again. As sap becomes more viscous, our thermometer slowly climbs to seven degrees above boiling. Slippery bubbles appear and we shout out loud just before the pot boils over, real maple syrup. We fill funnels placed in glass bottles, thick amber liquid settles. We cap and lay the hot bottles on their sides, watch bubbles disperse. Near midnight, we can, but for excitement, rest. And then the third poem of this section is about another horse. I wrote this in a workshop with Jane Hirschfield. She had a lot to say because she has a horse and she is a very good horsewoman. And she couldn't believe that I had oats in my hand. She couldn't figure how I got to the store and bought them. You'll see, I, they grow at, at our farm. You just pick them. <laughs> anyway, we had quite a talk about horses, but the poem came out well, and it was published. I think it, it came in as a finalist in the Nogatok Review. The poem is called Stallion on the Road. She's been out walking long past our agreement. I hurry out the dirt road of our farm, check the path through the pond, and they appear. My 16-year-old daughter and a huge horse crest the hill. Where did he come from? 16 hands, he wears no saddle, no bridle, marches in parade step, points his hooves as he walks beside my daughter. Next to her bouncing chestnut hair, he swishes his chestnut tail. He's big, and loose and doesn't know us. He wheels, kicks up his hooves, trots over to me, jumps, just missing my toes. I try to quiet him with pats and hellos. Whirling right, he bolts the wire fence, gallops through acres of meadow into our woods. He speeds with an abrupt turn toward the far hill below the maples, a steep drop to the highway. In minutes, the glossy quarter horse races back to me leaps up on hind feet, <laughs> muscles shining, whinnies, shakes his head. Juliet edges back by the choke cherries. Come here, you runaway boy. My vo voice calm, yet I see my hand shake. He teases right back, tries to nibble my jacket as I back away. He repeats his wild gallop. We laugh at his dance, his playful flirting. He returns to my call, taking hastily picked oats from my hand. He could knock me flat, trample either one of us. Juliet goes silent. How to hold his majesty and manage fear at the same time. We breathe normally only after our neighbor arrives, holding a hand fashioned bridle, talking his horse home. Jared? Well, this one is a, um, another vocal. Um, the words to it, though, one moment. The words to it are not in English, they're in Zulu. It's a song that was written by a, a musician from Zimbabwe in 1952 uh, called Gwabi Gwabi. And uh, um, uh, from the Zulu, the words basically mean, here, Gwabi Gwabi, I have a girlfriend. She lives in Nankambien, and sure, I love her. Uh, I will buy her buns and sweets and bananas. That's it. <laughs> so here's Gwabi Gwabi. Gwabi Gwabi Kuzwang Leng Tong Biami. He's on Lake Gambi, Shungi a 
cantando, guabi guabi kuswang le zom biami, isan le kambi shungi antanda, neza mo tengi lama banzi, isi wiji le banana, neza mo tengi lama banzi, isi wiji le banana. Thank you, Jared. Now I'm on again? Yeah. Okay, this is the last set, set of three poems. And the first one is about my mother and her two sisters, Jane and Betty. Uh, this poem came to me one day when I was swimming. It's called Skimming the Water. This morning I swim laps, startled to a stop when bird wings shudder overhead. Looking up, a flock of squawking Canada geese. So like mother, I say aloud. I ran along such a skein the morning she died, late fall in Kentucky, cold. They honked for five minutes, me feeling their ruckus in my shoulders, sensing mom's spirit flying away with them. They skimmed the pond across from her house. I ran beside, then under them, until I ran out of breath, blinking hot tears on chilling skin, next to a frozen field of dried corn stalks rattling. Today, draped across the lane, the lane line in the blue pool, I cry for her leaving, her open talking to her sisters, all of them together, these 30 years of missing her. And this poem is from my husband, Greg. It's called Our Kiss. I need the kiss I remember, our kiss. Our kiss right now feels as deep as the wells on the farm, 150 feet down. From the minute you turn the pump, clear, pure water comes up. When you drink it in, a long drink without stopping. You know you've never tasted water before, and you drink it because it's endless. When you think you're finished, the water trickles up the pipe again. You can hear it for the next time. You feel clean. Your skin glows. You feel light-filled touched between your toes, to the bottoms of your feet, your arches even, and your lips rest, pink, slaked, without lines. The last poem came to me after I spent a wonderful day with my brother Ralph in Lancaster, Pennsylvania area, in the Amish country, a couple years ago. The towns there have very interesting names like Intercourse and Bird in Hand. The poem is called Over to Bird in Hand. Let's meet in Lancaster, rent an Amish horse and buggy, ride over to Bird in Hand. We can take the back roads where the green expanse of corn and wheat lie in fields side by side undulate under a blue sky, brimful of cumulus. The sky taller there, where Am Amish women in navy blue jumpers and lace caps 
hang out their wash on clotheslines with wooden clothespins, each one carved from a single piece of wood. Where men in blue shirts and straw hats will walk behind horse-drawn plows or sit on wooden hay wagons, their blue-shirted children rolling down the hay bales. We will pull over to look, to remember. It was simple and known early what the heart can see. You will take my hand, lay the reins over it, touch the leather and the top of my hand together, a warm breeze riffling the horse's mane and tail, our hair and clothes. I wanted to uh, let you know that the picture you see behind us now is the farm on the farmhouse, <laughs> the farmhouse on the farm, um, and all the trees. The trees in the front of the farm are the sugar maples that we tapped last uh, oh, no. year ago, March. And I also wanted to thank uh, Patrick Fanning for the beautiful watercolor of the woods that he let me stand in for my poems. Um, the, the, they resemble the woods on the farm. I, this isn't really a question. It's just more of a thank you, Donna, for doing all the work that you do in poetry. It's always a pleasure. And I do have a question, and that is, now that this book has come out, are you thinking of another one? And given the environment that we find ourselves in, will any of this uh, climate or madness be part of what you might do in the future? Well, that is a tough question to answer during the pandemic and during the fires. Uh, it's, it's hard to even write some days. But I have a whole uh, group of poems that, I, that I've decided to make into a third book. I think I'm going to call it Bodies of Water. And um, I, I don't want to do one right away. I, the last two books I did one after the other, and uh, that was too hard. Um, I, I'm going to take a little break, and the pandemic allows us to do that. <laughs> Everybody, Rita and I were in a my very first writing group together, and she's a very well-known author now of a, um, I don't even know where to start, your memoir. Um, tell us the name of it so everybody can hear it. I don't know how I'm coming across. Rita. Did you hear me? There. Oh. Something happened to the mute. Read is muted. Tina, could you unmute un Rita? There. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> going to mention our, our first meeting and how we became fast friends. It was a memoir writing workshop at UC Berkeley. I think it was just, just a weekend or a couple of weekends long. And from then on, uh, she started writing her poems and her, her memoir. And I started writing my memoir, which is uh, called The Coconut Latitudes. And it's about growing up on a coconut farm in the Dominican Republic and the Caribbean. And uh, 
it just came out as an audible book also. Thank you, Donna, for allowing it's me to it's a wonderful plug book. my book. <laughs> Glad you're here. Juliet, did and you Donna? hear something? Oh, I hear someone. Oh, sorry, that was just me again saying I was so happy to see Paula here. I think she's gone, but yes. Yeah. Yes, Paula. Another was in one that of our too. early. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> I do have a question. Um, I was wondering how poems come to you. How does that work? Oh, when you think of an idea. How does it how does it come to you? I did say that twice. I said this poem came to me when I was swimming. Well, in that case, the birds sounded exactly like the birds over me the day that mother died, so I could not ever forget that. So it's usually a, a sound or a, an image of something that uh, jangles a memory uh, or an image that I want to write about. Um, it's almost a physical thing. Um, I mean, when I saw your painting when you were five, it was so cute I had to write about it. <laughs> and. Um, I'm, I'm sure every writer would say something a little different in answer to that question, but um, I usually don't just write because someone says, please write about this horse, it, but something has to happen to me and the horse, like in Stallion on the Road, that was sort of unforgettable. Sometimes my poems start out as dreams. I wake up with the poem that came from the dream a mother's in a lot of my dreams. Um, or like the, the, the last poem about bird in hand that came to me after having that wonderful day in the uh, Amish country with Rao. It was just such a lovely, crazy time. <laughs> okay, so next we have a question from Andrea Granahan. Andrea, if you can hit your un unmute. There. There she is. Uh, it's not so much a question as uh, <laughs> it's a statement that your poem about the kiss is one of the best poems I have ever heard about kiss. And I don't <laughs> know what, what I felt like I knew more fully than I had before, a well or a kiss. <laughs> and I just compliment you and thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you for hearing it. Very nice. Okay. So next we have Susan Bono. If you could hit your Susan! Own. Yay! You're here! <laughs> oh, and and all these technical, I just think I figured <laughs> something like zoom out and, and I couldn't get my question. I don't know. I Here I am. Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, this is so wonderful. And um, the way that you write about place, uh, place always seems to be such a, an important element in your work. And I was wondering if you had a few things to say about the draw of place or home for you. What do you, kind of some thoughts about that? Oh, sure. Well, as a child, I moved around a lot. My brother is here and he could tell you also, I moved 30 times by the time I was 30 because I had a very ambitious father who was advancing in his career to yet another city, another state. Um, and that was hard on us all. And so we had the farm in the summers and that was the constant, that was the constant place. And it still is a constant place for me. Um, and I think it's, um, it made me always feel like I had a home, even when I had to leave the second grade and the boy I liked across from me, you know, and even though I had to leave another place and leave the school that was the best school I'd ever been to, but I always had the farm and I always had grandma and grandpa there. I was so lucky to have all four of my grandparents until my 40s and 50s. So it was a lifetime of, uh, of joy with 
that generation that knew so many things that we did not. Um, like Grandpa in that first poem about the well, he, he usually had a lesson for us, at least when he met with me, he had a lesson for me. And then we would sit a while with it. And it was like a, a tradition almost to he'd teach me how to do this or show me that. And then we'd sit. And I was just, I think I was supposed to think about it a while. <laughs> but I just liked being with him. That was great. So that's a nice question. Thank you. It's, it's certainly, it's all true. <laughs> but the, the farm is home. The farm will always be home. Okay, so now we have Diana Jorgensen. Did I say that right? Diana. Where did she go? I don't see her. Oh. Okay, then we're going to move on to Michael. You should say her name is Jorgensen. Jorgensen. With a J. Okay. Well, we have Michael Rohrbach. Can I say oh, Michael. Can I see Michael. You've got it. Unmuted. Can you see me, Don? I can see your I can ceiling. See our ceiling. You can see our ceiling. Okay, well, here, let me put this back on the gallery view. Oh, that's, that's because my hand's over the camera. I'm holding it. So, Donna, uh, here we are in the Shenandoah Valley. There, and this is my wife, Lucy, whom you've never met. Say hello, Lucy. Hello, hello Donna. Hi, and Lucy. So, Lucy. Pictures, of you. pictures of you. Yeah, yeah. Um, know, all, know all these, some of these characters you're talking about. But the, the question is, how did you how did you choose the poems to read tonight? Um, I, I assume most of them are in your new book, but at least one, The Kiss, was from your first book, right? It's an older poem. Yeah? But because it's about the wells, I put it in oh, this book. It's about the wells, okay. Well, yeah. I really like that poem, The Kiss. Could you give us some background on that in terms of, um, you know, whatever, whatever might be interesting about it? Yeah. Well, uh, well, you all know a lot about kissing. Uh, <laughs> that's what's we in do. the poem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, we had just built our well on the farm after building the little house. And so I got to know that well very well. And it, it was just amazing how it is never ending. It just works and then it comes back again and again and again. And uh, it made me think that that was like a kiss, a good kiss. A good kiss. Okay, a good kiss. All right. So no, no particular kiss, but a good kiss in, in principle. So mm -hmm. which, um, were there other poems? Um, were, were all the other poems from, from your current book? or? Yes. Well, oh, the two, the two uh, um, maple syrup poems, they were in the middle of being produced, uh, published by the Chicago Quarterly Review. And the timing didn't work out to put them in this book, but they should be in this book because they're as about as central as the farm can get. Um, so if anyone wants those poems as well, I'll send them to you. <laughs> uh, as right. far as, cho as choosing the poems, you ask that. Um, I decided not to read any of the political poems that are in the book, though there are a few. I I'm so sick of politics. I'm so sick of this place that we all live in right now, um, but I didn't want to read them today. Uh, but they're quite uh, engrossing, I think. And then I, wa I wanted to mainly read the poems that relate to the wells and the farm, and uh, people can most directly see what I experienced there. Right. Um, so there are many others. There are many others that are just lyric poems, too, not just stories. So, yeah. good. Do you have a copy of this book? No, I, but I'm, I'm certainly going to get one. Well, oh, that's the right it. thing to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now, one more question: Is your is your is your brother Ralph in, in attendance? Yeah, I can see him at or the top of my screen with his wife Carolyn. Hi, Ralph. Oh, there he is. Oh my God. Okay. Oh, there he is. Oh my. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay, we're going to try one more time for Diana Jorgensen. I think we got it straightened out. I think so. I think I remuted myself not knowing I was going to do it. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you both to Donna and Jared for an absolutely fabulous hour. Uh, Donna, I had a specific question about one of the poems you didn't read, but I have read in your book, and it was the Grandmother Armstrong one. 
Oh yeah. I know that you have a huge influence from your family on a lot of your poetry, but that one I was really quite struck by, and it seemed like she was a really important figure in your life. Can you talk at all about how uh, your relationship with her sort of informed your poetry and how it influenced the way you, you, you write that poem? Well, I'm very fond of grandmothers, having had the most wonderful grandmothers in the world. So I always want to meet them. And this one was uh, Cole's grandmother um, in Alabama. And, and she was blind. Um, but we had a real connection and she, she understood things immediately um, in a way that most of the rest of the family did not. And I would sit with her in her room in Alabama in the summer. It was always in the summer and the fans were on. Um, and I just felt like we could be of any age in any century when I was with her because she, she was so intelligent and had read so much. And she listened to books for the blind, um, which my friend Virginia, who's here, I think used to read for. <laughs> um, and she, she taught me a lot, including about him, uh, things that I didn't know. And I certainly knew things that she didn't know and that I wrote in the poem about. <laughs> um, but she was a very gracious Southern, Southern now woman. She had been, I think she had come from Rochester originally and um, lived with her daughter and son-in-law. And, um, I like to just go and sit with her in the silence. I, I was talking to Susan Bono yesterday about silence. I, I'm very fond of silence. Thank you. <laughs> she, she brought that to me too. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Glad to see you. Thanks. Hello. 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 I actually have a question, but Newell just really wanted to say hi to his um. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Noel. My grandson, my only grandson. Who just hi, 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 hi. We'll make more potions. Good. One more, take one, not, not the one. Just one. Okay. Right. We're going to say bye-bye to... Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So I, I think um, we're going to be um, uh, ending our, our event, but there there's several important things to, uh, to tell you. Within a few minutes, all of you who've registered are gonna receive an email on how to purchase the book. Oh. And there are also instructions if you go onto our OCA event site, um, you'll have instructions as well on how to purchase the book through credit card, PayPal, uh, et cetera. Um, so, so we really encourage you to buy the book. The other good news is this, this whole event, um, has been recorded. So it will be moved to YouTube and you can, uh, go to it anytime and watch it on YouTube. Um, which is a wonderful thing. And also to share with those who could not be here this afternoon, uh, who wanted to be. Um, I just can't thank you enough, both of you and Tina and Donna and Jared for such a delightful afternoon. Um, it was really heartfelt. I think we all felt each other in the room. Mm -hmm. At one point I noticed we had 55 participants. We may have had more, but that's what I was seeing. Um, that's huge. Mm -hmm. uh, just thank you so much. And then I did want to just let everyone know 
that um, you invited to join us a week from Friday at 7 p.m. for Mary Gaffney's uh, recently published book, A Road Less Paved, um, about her family adventures in Central and South America. Mm. And um, she is a longtime OCA supporter and volunteer and dear, dear friend. And so you're, you're, you're uh, very much invited. Um, the way to do it, just as you did with Donna's, is you visit the website um, and uh, register on, at, the, at the website, and then you'll be sent the Zoom link, um, probably the morning of the day of the event, if not before. Um, is there anything else, Tina, that I should be mentioning? Still no, I think this went really well. Thanks to everyone for joining us for this historic virtual event of OCAs. Yeah, to total success. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a great evening. Yay! <laughs>